real esoteric spirituality without all of the fluff, without all of the nonsense. This is the ThunderWizard.com YouTube channel. Click subscribe and then hit the little bell button so that you can be notified whenever I've uploaded a video or when I'm doing the live Q&A videos. Hello, Thunder Wizards. So today, this evening, I want to talk to you about a fourfold overall methodology of achieving spiritual awareness in the Aquarian age. We are headed and have been making this uh, transfer from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius for some time. And um, we're still heading into it. It's sort of like a change of seasons. And, you know, oftentimes when the seasons change, it's not like one day it's summer and then the next day it's fall, or one day it's fall and the next day it's winter. What uh, happens is that we start to shift and then we have this back and forth until things settle down. Like now we're, we're deep into winter here, where I am anyway, we're deep into winter. I mean, it's every day, you know, in fact, I can't remember the last time it was this cold here, Southern California. Um, but we're deep into this winter and it's, you know, like 50 something degrees every day, whether the sun's out or not, it's been raining, it's cold and yeah, it's like, wow, what the hell happened to California? But, um, you know, it didn't just land that one day and stay. And so we're making a shift from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. And the age of Pisces was at its height during the Middle Ages, during the Dark Ages. The time when, you know, what existed was there were these uh, feudal lords, these kings and, um, you know, the elites, and they lived in these big stone castles. And beneath them were all of their serfs, their servants. And there really wasn't any law, you know, anywhere. So... If you didn't have a big giant castle, then you were probably, you needed to live on the grounds of some lord's enormous estate. And uh, you had to do that for protection because there was, a, everybody else had a castle and armies. So you were either in the army or you were the elites in the castle or you were one of those guys walking around with those, you know, pitchforks. And just to give you an idea of, you know, there was a merchant class as well, so I won't, you know, don't let me leave them out. There was a merchant class as well, but they weren't uh, as uh, as powerful as, you know, now we're just a giant merchant class. But um, just to give you an idea of how, how horrible it was, you know, uh, the people that lived and, and farmed for the, the lord in the castle, they used their own excrement as um, fertilizer. So whenever you see like those feudal people and they're eating this slop, right? It's just, it looks like porridge or slop or something. It's because that they had to boil their food to sanitize it. And so even if you wanted to eat vegetables, you had to take the vegetables that had grown from your own excrement. You had to take that in and you had to boil it in some water and then you just had this the slop. And if you're lucky, maybe you got some uh, protein out of it as well. That's why people drank wine all the time, you know, because uh, the water wasn't all that great. So you had the haves and the have-nots. The, the Piscean Age was characterized by those that had and those that didn't. And that was pretty much it. There was a tiny middle class that really wasn't uh, as... Um, dominant as it is now. And so you had the religious structure also mimicked that. So that's why in the Middle Ages you have these pictures of this emaciated Jesus on the cross, you know, and he's just basically skin and bones. And uh, that's what people worship because that was their experience. Their experience was you get through this horrific life 
And on the other end of this horrific life is eternal life. And the more that you suffer, you know, the more you will be rewarded later with, you know, uh, clouds and uh, harps. And I don't know what the hell they thought they were getting up there. And so that has been the way that we've functioned. And things have really shifted. I mean, you know, things have shifted more now in the past, and it continues. It's, it's, the shifts are exponential. And I'm, I'm just talking about social and uh, as well as technological. Like, it's just since I've been alive. The technological advancements have been uh, unreal. And, you know, the same was true, you know, if you go back 50 years before I was born. Um, you know, the same, same thing. Yeah, it was just, and then 50 years before that. So we're making these, um, these exponential leaps. And uh, so in order to be able to tolerate that, we need to spiritually grow as well. And... What is going to happen is there's going to be a continual decrease in the gurus. And I don't mean guru in the sense of just your teacher, but I mean guru in the sense of the God, the immortal, the enlightened teacher. I, I don't know about you, but I am becoming less and less tolerant of it. There's, um, you know, I have a teacher in mind right now, I won't mention his name, who, you know, when I listen to him talk, he says some pretty good stuff. He gets pretty close to getting to some real truth, and he kind of stops part way. But, you know, you can tell that he, he he's, he's pretty smart. He knows what's going on. But he allows himself to be presented as an enlightened master, which means that we are encouraged to think that he has no emotional issues that he has no human interaction, that he is just this divine being. And when I listen to him talk, he lets things out that, um, I mean, he's really good. I mean, he's really good at, at spinning this, I'm a very humble but wise teacher. And, but every now and then he lets it slide. And I heard him last, you know, the last time that I listened to him, he, um, allowed, he, he himself made himself equal with Shiva. And he did it in such a way that if you weren't listening, you'd miss it because he was saying something else about, you know, how he's here to serve others and all that kind of, and people, oh, he, oh, Guru's here to serve us. And, but he slipped out that he pretty much equated himself equal with Shiva. Now, as you know, I think that we're all divine. So I, have a, I don't have a problem with people identifying and wanting to become and seeing themselves equal to the gods. But... Also, we have to acknowledge that we are humans. We are human beings, and we've chosen to be human beings. We've chosen to have this experience in a limited context, three-dimensional time, space-time, in these, in these meat bags. That, you know, we have these, these big, giant heads, you know, that uh, we have to carry around this big, giant computer so that we can, you know, function. And that's all that this is. All this is up here is a computer. It's a computer that's used to interface with our soul. Our soul is having a 3D virtual reality experience. And so I want to talk about that because uh, today I'm going to talk to you about four, the four necessary tools in my experience and in my opinion the four necessary tools that we need in order to get the most out of our human experience. And experience is the operative word there. We have come here to have an experience. You know, I talk about learning, and, and now I'm starting to get, as, even now as I'm talking about it, I'm starting to realize why people seem to, to misunderstand me when I say, We've chosen to reincarnate so that we can learn. And people say, well, if we're these uh, all-knowing infinite beings, why do we need to learn anything? And that's, that, that is coming from a false assumption. That's coming from the assumption of somebody who lives through their intellect. So people think that learning is having knowledge of something. 
And that's not what learning is. Intellectual knowledge is, again, it's a roadmap. It's just here to help you get from point A to point B in this terrain. It's what a map is. You have a map and you live in the mountains and you need a map to get somewhere. You have to get out the map and look at where the mountains are in the terrain. You have to know what the terrain is. But once you know what the terrain is, you don't need the map anymore. You just drive to where you want to go. The intellect is a map. It's just here to figure out what's up, what's down, what's this, what's that, what's good, what's bad, what's safe. What's... But we live in our intellects. You know, I've talked about it at length. I won't go too deep into it here, but... Um, the Abrahamic religions, especially Christianity, is designed to keep you trapped in your intellect because when you're trapped in your intellect, you're not connected to your emotions, you're not connected to your experience, and if you're not connected to your experience and your emotions, then people control you through ideas. And those ideas don't have to make any sense. You know, a perfect example of... Uh, you know, the idea of, you know, the earth being seven days old. You know, if you tell somebody this is the truth, and if you don't believe this truth, you're going to go to hell. And I don't care what reality seems to be telling you. You have to intellectually adopt this belief, or you will be punished. And so people stay in their heads because they're afraid to have an experience. They don't, you're told not to trust your experience. And I, you know, and I'm here to say that this life is an experience. We have come here to experience life physically, emotionally. We have come here to have this experience. And so learning is not about how much knowledge, you know, book knowledge you have stuffed in your head or how much theory. You know, again, talking about Christians who just read the Bible. I, I know I used to be one read the Bible all day, and they just memorize this, and they memorize the dogma that's in there, and now they think they have spiritual knowledge. And they're bound by that. Their, their experience is constantly giving them different, different realities, and they're rejecting that in favor of what's, you know, they've stuck in their head. So we're here to have an experience, and we're here to learn and to grow. Learning and growing is an emotional experience. It's a spiritual experience. So the growth is not, and the knowledge, the learning is not about what you can stuff into your intellect. So I've got four tools here. And I've put this loosely in importance to uh, what I think it should be. And the first one is, energy work. We live in a physical reality. You know, I, this is one of the reasons I hammer away at the people who, you know, want to focus on being stuck in a computer program matrix. It's, you know, pretty clear to me that these are people who are in a lot of emotional pain and intellectually they're just so screwed up with all this. They don't know what to believe and what not to believe. So they take the easy way out and they say, well, this is just an illusion. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing here. It's not a real physical experience. I'm just having a, a giant, you know, hallucination. So get me the hell out of this hallucination. So they want to continuously take themselves out of their body and out of their emotions. But we live in a physical universe that is woven with spiritual energy. So you got it half right. If you think this is just an illusion, you're half right. But this is a very real illusion that is made up of actual energy. And so to get the most out of this experience of this illusion, we must connect to the energy of it. And everything is made up of diff differing density of life force energy. You can call it chi, you can call it prana, you can call it organ, I don't care what word you want to use. Spiritual energy. Spiritual energy is what creates everything and it's just different densities of, of the same fundamental substance. 
And so in order for us to be able to interact with this three-dimensional virtual reality, uh, we need energy. And it's important that we not be in denial. I, look, I understand. I, I've had my own experience. I don't know what yours is like. I can't speak for you. I'm not trying to compete with you. I've had my own experience of a very challenging life. Very difficult, very challenging life. Of the three kids in my family, I'm the only one that has escaped intact. <laughs> my brother and my sister, not doing well. They, they, they weren't able to survive it. And these are the tools I'm going to share with you. These are the tools that have saved my life and continue to save my life and uh, allow me to have this experience. But like many people and many people who are spiritual seekers are people who have gone through trauma and have gone through dysfunction and they're looking for a way out. And so that's why gurus like my, the, the guy I spoke about earlier, the guy who allows himself to be represented as this fully enlightened being with no problems and no issues, and he's equal to the gods, and he's here to serve you. And what a crock of shit. It's not helpful for anybody. It's a great way to make a living, you know, and... If I wasn't who I was, I, ex I know exactly what that formula is, man. If I wanted to, of course, I wouldn't be able to survive it because I can't. I wouldn't be able to live, live with myself. Because I want to get the most out of this experience, and in order to do that, I've got to stay connected to my integrity to the best that I can. And I'm here to tell you that I'm as human as you are. I'm no more or less human than anybody. I might, I might have a little more experience in a couple of different things, but you have more experience than I do in some things too. So what difference does it make? I'm as human as you are. And I'm here to tell you that uh, I've learned that the only way to truly conquer the challenges of this life is through fully embracing the experience of it. And in the beginning, if you've been running away, and I'm not judging it, if you have been trying to escape your challenges and difficulties, it's going to be challenging because you have to turn around 180 degrees and go against the, you know, the movement that has been going away from experience and go towards it. Um, so these are the four tools uh, that I'm going to share with you. So energy work is the first one, and I'm, again, going in – Loose importance, I mean, don't hold me to it. I'm not trying to create a dogma here, but this has been what has been most helpful for me. Energy work. And I don't care if we're talking about yoga, tai chi, uh, qigong, um, you know, any kind of, anything that involves uh, breath, uh, not just breath and movement, but um, conscious breath and movement. When you uh, combine those two things, you get connected first and foremost to the energy of the universe that surrounds us. This illusion, this matrix is made up of conscious life force energy. And when we connect to that, then we also become empowered and, you know, connected. One of the things that happens, and the reason why I do this, not only is it physically healthy for you, um, and spiritually healthy and all that, but it connects three parts of you which are very important. It connects you energetically, which of course opens up all the meridians and the organs and everything feeds off of life force energy, so life force energy is your nourishment. You need it. The most basic form of life force energy everybody does, they just breathe. Just breathing in and out is, is the lowest form of life force energy, and it will keep you alive. But to take it to the next level, then you start to gain real health, real life. That's why, you know, you have that, uh, those, um, you know, those ideas of the old man in China. You know, the 80-year-old man, he's, 
he's old and he looks very frail, but he's this Tai Chi master, but you know, he's really healthy and strong. And wow, how can that little old man do all that? It's because he's connected to life force energy. Maybe, you know, the master has spent his whole life connecting to it. Um, so uh, it, it, it does give the body real ability to live and to grow. And that's why we have, there are Qigong healers out there who use uh, their powers of energy to heal. Um, and there's a whole different class of that. I'm not just talking about Reiki. That's one class. Then there's people who take their energy and put it into others, and they can heal people with that. It's because they have an abundance of this nourishing life force energy in their body. So who wouldn't want that? Who wouldn't want to have that? But it does more than just empower you physically. It also connects to you emotionally. You cannot work with life force energy without connecting on an emotional level. This is one of the reasons why people don't do this. If there are people who are afraid of life force energy, they don't like it for whatever reason, um, there's a good chance that it's because it stimulates them to experience things on an emotional level. And if they're running away from their emotions, then they're not going to want to do that. So that it gives awareness. We've got to become aware of what we're feeling. And so energy work connects us physically to our emotion, our, our physical body, our energy body, to our emotional body. Now, once we begin to awaken to our emotional reality, then what starts to happen is that the unconscious mind, which holds all of our present and uh, past life unresolved karmic issues. So let's talk about karma for a moment. You know, there's a difference between dharma and karma. Dharma, you know, like the, uh, the stereotype of the, you know, the hippie in the, in the coffee shop who, you know, clinks onto the tip jar and says, hey, karma, man. You know, like, you know, if you don't give me a tip, then bad karma will happen to you. What he really should do is click on the thing and say, dharma, man. Because that's really what he means. Karma is just the law of cause and effect. In previous lifetimes, uh, you have come here, otherwise you wouldn't have reborn. You have come here with some unresolved karmic, and karma is an energy. Remember, everything is energy. So it's like being tied. It's like having a rope tied around you that goes all the way back to a previous lifetime, maybe multiple lifetimes. And it's like slowing down your progress. It literally slows down your progress. It's an unresolved issue. And um, so you bring that with you into this life. And this is lodged in your unconscious mind. And it means you're not aware of it. It's, uh, it's, it's fueling your actions or inactions in this life. And so these need to be released. You know, they're like knots that need to be released. And once you release them, then ideally you get to look at them and uh, become conscious of what it is you've been doing. Oh my God, I've been seeking relationships for this and not for this. Or I've been obsessed with money because of this or not for this. You know, there are some people who like uh, have physical issues, um, you know, because of a way that they died in a previous lifetime. You know, people are addicted to food or addicted to whatever. It could be because they starved in a previous lifetime. So they, no matter how much you try and talk to the brain and explain to them, hey, you really need to limit your portions of food, it doesn't stop them from, they can't help themselves. And a lot of these people, they have a past life issue where they they starve to death. And so in this life, they're trying to resolve it unconsciously. So when you become conscious and aware, like energy work will, will release some of those things, and sometimes you will have a past life experience, and then you can let it go. I've had one. I've had uh, numerous ones, but I had one that really, you know, the reason I'm sitting here before you teaching is because of an experience I had um, while I was doing yoga one morning. And I was doing these uh, these you know, these spinal twists and bends, you know, in the spine, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, I had this waking vision. 
<sighs> and I went back into time. It was in medieval France, and I was a uh, Catholic priest, and I was being torn to shreds by the townspeople, dragging me through the street, nailed me to the doors of the church, and they literally tore the flesh off of my body. They were so rageful at me. It was because I was teaching them the kinds of things that I'm teaching now. And, um, you know, people back then couldn't hear it. You know, it was just too much. It was too revolutionary for them. My part in it was is that being who I am, I don't oftentimes, um, you know, give, give people what they can hear. I just give them the whole chunk of truth and I shove it down their throat because that's how I want to hear it, so I'm going to give it to you the way I want. And that's very selfish of me. That's very narcissistic of me. And if my job is here to serve, then ideally I want to be able to give the information to people in a way that they can handle. And uh, so that pushed them over the edge, and a bunch of other things happened. And um, anyway, they tore me to shreds. And I remember looking up at the sky, you know, that, that – beautiful French blue sky with the clouds. And I remember looking up at the sky, and as I was dying, saying, because I was a Christian, I was saying to, to Jehovah, why you told me to do this? Why are you letting them do this to me? And that was the last thought I had before I died. So I've been carrying that around with me. And in this life, in my early 20s, uh, I started, you know, doing what I do. I was going into some deep esoteric stuff and I started having awarenesses and seeing that I saw things that even my teachers didn't see and then, and then the impetus for me to go and teach that and share that and I became, you know, really paralyzed with, with fear and my life was just going nowhere and I was stuck. And I was working with my teacher and um, he said, there's some, some past life thing and I don't know what was going on but just him talking, just sort of, and I started weeping, saying, they're, they're going to kill me. He says, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. They're going to kill me. Who's going to kill you? I don't know, them. And then it took a little while for me to become aware. I, I, I was afraid of teaching because if I teach the truth, I was afraid there, that people would rise up and kill me. Listen up. You've been lied to about the nature of the matrix. What if I told you that you could hack into the matrix? I've done it, and I can teach you how to do it. Click below to watch the free video that I put on my YouTube channel a few years ago that has since gone viral. I discovered that the matrix, like everything else in the universe, operates from certain rules. There are five rules that govern the matrix. And then there is one secret technique that, to my knowledge, nobody else has figured out that allows you to hack into the matrix understanding these five rules and using these five rules to control, manipulate, and change reality so that you can have exactly what you want out of life. Don't allow yourself to be deceived by the victim mentality that has been thrust upon you by everybody in the media and in modern society, in history, in religion. You have the power to hack into the matrix, to control your life, and have the life of your dreams. Click below, watch the free video, and then learn how you can do what I've been doing for myself over the past few years. So you can see I've gotten over the majority of that. Um, but that is a result of doing energy work. If I hadn't done energy work, I wouldn't have released that, the, those, those little clumps of past life, what they call samskaras in, in the Vedic, stuck in your aura, and then become conscious of it. You have all these things stuck in your unconscious mind, and they need to be, uh, they need to be released. And you can do the first step, in my experience, is through energy work. You've got to connect your, your energy body to your emotional body. And by becoming conscious of your emotions, you can follow the emotions to the source of it, which will be somewhere in your unconscious mind. Okay? So the first step uh, to uh, in the Aquarian age, to be able to become 
uh, spiritually uh, evolved is energy work of some kind. I have, as you know, I teach uh, a form of Qigong that for me, you know, let's go train with somebody else if you want to learn their thing. I'm not competing with anybody. But for me, the most powerful one is the Celestial Qigong. I recommend it. If you can't, and it's not for everybody. Some people can't handle it. It's too intense. It's not that it's hard. It's incredibly simple. It's the simplest thing you can imagine. You just stand in the posture for a little bit, and, and all kinds of stuff happens. But the vibration is too intense for some people. So go on to the free YouTube channel or go on to um, you know, my other websites and look for the, uh, the other DVDs uh, that I have about energy work and do those. There's plenty of free stuff on my channel. Just do some kind of energy work. Get you connected to your energy body, your breath, your emotions, your objective mind. So let's move into the next part. So when you do energy work, one of the goals of energy work is to give you the power to meditate. Meditation is not simply closing your eyes and going into a place of emptiness. If you can do that, my hair is off to you. I can't do that. Uh, and I don't judge myself for that because that's not the way I'm built. It's not the way I'm wired. In order for me to get to that place, I have to do a ton of energy work. And when I get a ton of energy work going, then I can go into this, because I have so much power, I can go into this place of emptiness. And that's great. If you can close your eyes and do that, my hat's off to you. I can't do it. Uh, the biggest... Uh, uh, objection that I have gotten over the years from people when I say what do you do and sometimes I just I don't know what to tell people what do you do for a living I don't even know what to say so I say oh I'm a meditation teacher and they go oh I can't meditate I go, what do you mean you can't meditate oh I can't empty my mind you're not supposed to empty your mind when you get to the place of having uh, accomplish something on an energetic level, then you will go to a place of, of emptiness. But it's not, it's not that's the, the end result. And you can only have that end result when you have enough energy. You know, there, there are a lot of people who can't sleep, by the way. People who have insomnia. They can't sleep because they don't have enough energy. They think that they have too much energy. They think, oh, I, I have too much energy, I can't calm down. No, you can't calm down because you don't have enough. It takes, more, uh, it takes more energy to close your eyes than it does to open them. You know, when you actually start to fall asleep and your eyes can close, it's because you have enough energy. That's why when people, when, especially when they do the Qigong, they just get really sleepy. Because finally, for the first time, the body has enough life force energy that they can sleep. So having that emptiness is the same way. It's about having enough energy. It's not by, you know, having too little. It's not about becoming catatonic. It's a state of dynamic awareness. So meditation is the next tool that uh, uh, I find to be helpful. And that is because meditation, true meditation, is having the ability with the mind, not the intellect, but the mind to be able to reflect the spirit. And when you're in that state, then you can look at yourself and look at your life and your circumstances from a more circumspect vantage point. You have a more objective understanding. That's, you know, like you have a problem with somebody and you're fighting and you, you can't seem to, you know, and you're pissed off at them and why aren't they doing this and they got to do that. Just as an example, you go and uh, do some energy work and then do some meditation and then you'll go, oh, I see why they're doing that. And then you start to have compassion and understanding because you can see them. You get out, for, you know, instead of looking at things, you know, right in front of your face and you can't see, you know, what's going on because you're so wrapped up in the tiny details. You can pull back and see everything that's happening and then you have enough energy, which will give you compassion, which will give you the ability to reflect. So meditation is about reflecting. For me, I can't get to that point until I've got enough energy to do it. And that's what the energy work is about. 
So the energy work will, of course, do everything for you on the physical level, give you strength, give you, give you um, health and all that other good, good stuff, connect you to this universe. It will connect you emotionally. You can become aware of your emotions. Then you need to meditate so that you can then look at your emotions uh, and experience them, not disconnect from them and look at them from afar, but you get to experience them fully and then see them more circumspectfully. And then you can, you can become aware how you got yourself in that relationship in the first place, how you got yourself in that scenario in the first place. Okay? So that's number two is meditation. Number three, number three, this has been uh, absolutely life-changing for me. And it is a science. And you've heard me talk about it, and I'll talk about it again. Mantra. Mantra is uh, the antivirus program. It's an antivirus program that uh, hacks into your unconscious mind and will get rid of those things that uh, you can't do on your own through energy work and meditation. You know, it's like, um, you know, we've got this immune system and it's constantly, constantly attacking um, uh, invaders in our body. You know, all kinds of bacteria and viruses. You know, I mean, if, if we didn't have it, I mean, just the tiniest little bacteria and virus would kill us. But, it's, but sometimes our immune system gets overwhelmed, and that's when we get sick. We get the flu, we get the whatever. And um, not that, you know, I mean, uh, not that I'm saying to use this medication a lot, but using it as an example. Antibiotics. We have to have something to go in there because our immune system can't fight off uh, you know, those intense bacteria. And so you have to have uh, something to go in there and knock it out. This is what mantra does. Mantra goes in and destroys and breaks up the blocks that we can't do simply on our own just by trying to think about it. And they releases them, and then you get to become even aware on a, on a deeper level. Mantra always. Mantra is not just a saying. You know, like I have a motto, which uh, which is uh, make money doing what you would do anyway. You know, in the parlance of the time, somebody would call that a mantra. It's not a mantra. A mantra is a series of syllables uh, that, when put in a certain order, uh, creates an energetic equation. And that energetic equation is a deity. And there is, you know, people don't realize, this is one of the reasons why you should never do multiple mantras. If you have a mantra, stick with it. Don't do multiple mantras. There was a teacher, he's since passed away, but he, um, he, brought, he, he would write these books on, you know, mantra, and he would go and search all over India. You know, he was a Western guy. He searched all over India, got a bunch of mantras, and he really didn't know what the hell he was doing. He considered himself a, a master of mantra, but he really had no clue what he was doing. Because then he would create what, what he would call these mantra cocktails, where he would put four or five mantras together. He had some for this, for healing, and some for this. It was ridiculous. He didn't know that. I'm not judging him. He just didn't know. Uh, he was, he, you know, he'd been trained and was technically a Vedic priest, but he didn't have any clue what he was talking about. Because each mantra works with a planet and works with a deity. And then there is a rishi. A rishi is uh, a human being or an advanced uh, being that has seen this seed sound uh, equation in the fabric of the universe. So when you chant a mantra, you know, um, imagine there are billion or just infinite amounts of threads coming in to weave this experience that we have. And it's like grabbing one of those threads and then listening to it because everything is also sound. Everything has a sound vibration. 
And when you take certain this thread and this thread and you weave it together and, and you've got this, this combination of vibrations that work together to create something, this is this is this is uh, uh, this is what a mantra is. So you can't just make something up. Um, mantras, true mantras, are always seen by a rishi, either or heard by a rishi. And so you will have the mantra itself, which will be connected to a planet most of the time, and then it will be that the mantra itself will invoke a certain vibration of a deity. And then you have a rishi who sits on your head. So when you're doing multiple mantras, you've got all these different deities and these different rishis trying to sit on your head. And it gets very confusing. You know, it's like, you know, like I've said before, you know, trying to come up with your own mantra by going on to YouTube or going onto the internet and finding a mantra is like breaking into uh, a drugstore and uh, going over the counter and just grabbing some pills off of behind the counter and taking a bunch of them to see which one, you know, takes care of whatever problem. You know, it's you can kill yourself. It's just ridiculous. So mantra is is a is a, a really wonderful tool that is given to us. That for me, I can tell you, if it weren't for mantra, I don't know where I'd be. And I spent years and years and years practicing different mantras and trying different things with little or no success. And it wasn't until I started working with a Vedic astrologer who understood the science, who taught me what was going on and how to do it. And then, you know, I did more study in that area and I was able to come up and figure out what I could, you know, find that works for me. So, uh, so mantra is very important because again, we need to become aware and let go. Aware, become aware and let go of what's holding us back. Otherwise, we're doomed to repeat it. This is the thing about karma. Karma is is like a wheel that you know. If you if you don't get the hell off that wheel, you just keep going round and round and round. What we do is we project onto our three-dimensional life force energy screen of our life, we project our karmas. You know, some people say that your karmas are floating around in your aura, and then something will align where, boom, that's like the light shines through that samskara, and then it gets, it gets projected onto your world, and you experience that as something going on, something happening. And uh, what that, that happens because it's trying to give you the ability to let it go. And so the idea is to meditate through that, to experience those feelings and to meditate through them and take a different path this time around. But what ends up happening is it stimulates us to want to experience it again. And what we're trying to do on an unconscious level is fix it. So. You know, if somebody's been abused, uh, you know, I've, I've used this extreme example before, you know, women who get into abusive relationships, um, you know, they were abused as kids, and so they seek out men that reflect what their, whoever it was, their dad or their uncle or whomever, and they, they get attracted to them, they hook up with them, that person abuses them, and then they're back into that same craziness. What's, what's happening is they're trying to fix it. They're trying to stand up to them and fix it and then fix the problem and move on. So we replicate old wounds so that we can try and fix them. But what ends up happening is, you know, if they end up getting out of that relationship, they go find another guy that does the exact same thing. Why do I keep ending up with these abusive men? So you're trying to fix an old wound. So uh, instead of allowing that to just hammer us, because we project it onto our reality and then we experience it and we keep going through it over and over again, we need to be able to become consciously aware. This is what meditation is. Mantra is also that way. It seeks to pull that stuff out so that we become conscious of, oh, that's why I keep seeking out those kinds of people because of blah, 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 blah. And then you can make a different choice. So the first three things, energy work. Meditation, mantra, 
and then uh, yeah, energy work, meditation, mantra. And the fourth one, the fourth tool that we need in order to advance in the age of Aquarius is now we talk about spiritual theory. Now, after we've done all this work, now we can look at knowledge. Now we can look at theory. Now we can philosophize and talk. And that is when the intellect will be able to serve us. Because the intellect is here to serve you. And most people worship their intellect. And the intellect is like a dog. You know, if, if you've ever, uh, you know, my, my ex-wife used to raise and, uh, you know, used to raise and train show dogs. And, of course, she was into having those really fucking intelligent, little dogs, those barky, really intelligent little dogs, that if you do not discipline them and train them and, you know, become the alpha dog of the pack, they will destroy everything. They will tear up all the furniture. They'll crap on everything. They will completely try and rule you and control you. And a lot of people go get these dogs thinking, oh, that dog is so cute. And then they just have this terror that they cannot manage because the dog needs a very strong alpha to control them and, uh, you know, um, train them. And uh, our intellect is like that. Our intellect is here to serve us. You know, dogs, you know, were evolved uh, as a result of being in connection to human beings in order to uh, serve us and become, um, you know, guard dogs and hunters, and all kinds of other things. And our intellect is here to serve us as well. But if we do not uh, become the alpha through energy work, meditation, and, you know, in my, in my recommendation, mantra, if we don't get the power through that and the awareness because all those things will bring awareness to you, which is the whole point. When you get the awareness, then you can have the authority to tell the intellect, here's what I need you to do. I need you to figure that out. I need you to figure that out. Because the intellect is a computer. It's just here to figure things out. It's just here to calculate things for you. It's just a map. And so when you want to figure out you know, what the universe is made of and how this works, and you have all of this spiritual power and knowledge and awareness behind you, then your intellect will then be able to serve you and say, here's the data that I found. I found this, I found this, I found this, and from that, and from your meditative perspective, then you can go, oh, I think that means this, and this is what life is about, and that's what the universe is made of, and blah, 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 blah. But without that, the intellect will become that crazy dog that uh, tears up your furniture and craps all over the place and um, barks at everything and just makes your life miserable. And this is where most people live. In my experience, this is where most Westerners live. They live in their intellect. And again, the intellect, it's here to serve you. It's here to protect you. And if what is going on is that you are overwhelmed by your emotional experience, if you're in your uh, fight or flight mind, which most most Westerners are, then the intellect, uh, as the guard dog, says, "Okay, I'm going to protect you," and it says, "Stay away from your feelings." And it and people overthink; they just think and think and think. So you know, anybody here listening, if you ever comment on my channel and I type back way too much thinking. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying you are trapped in your intellect and you are distracting yourself from your feelings. You think you're being deep and whatever and you want to spout off about all you know. And for some reason, you think arguing with me, your point is somehow going to do something for you. That's somebody trapped in their intellect, avoiding their feelings. It's all I see when I hear that. So that's why, again, when people ask me questions, I keep coming back to ask me an honest question. Something that you, from an emotional perspective, want help with. That's how I can help you. You want to philosophize about nonsense, I'm going to get bored and annoyed and I'm not going to be, I don't want to be part of it. So, those are the four things. Uh, I have four tools that I, um, that I provide for people 
First one is Celestial Qigong. What first caught my attention about Celestial Qigong was how incredibly simple and easy to do the moves were. My teachers taught me that the most advanced high level energy work was always incredibly simple. I have been practicing and teaching Celestial Qigong for over 25 years and listen, I could tell you what the benefits have been for me, but why don't I let you hear it from some of my students, average people just like you, who have been practicing this ancient and transformative energy practice that I call Celestial Qigong. Hello, I'm Greg. Uh, I wanted to talk about Celestial Qigong and what has it has done for me. And the first time I did it, and I think after about three or four movements, I remember this look on my face going, whoa, I'm feeling a lot of energy here. Wow, this is amazing. It really helped me to start having visions. I mean, I'm talking about actual visions right behind my closed eyelids. And it's just really amazing what it's done for me. It's Hi, I wanted to make a quick video uh, a testimony of my experiences with Celestial Qigong which have been nothing short of miraculous and amazing. It is a pace, a union, the ability to manifest what I want, that I am in true total control of my life. I am. Hello, my name is McClovia. I have been practicing celestial qigong for about six months because i was having depression it has connected me to my higher self my nine-year-old does it with me and he says every night mom qigong was good tonight every <laughs> night me and my mom do it it's like a protection spell yeah i just want to th thank you this has really been good for me thank you and uh, in terms of mantra, we have astrology, astrology.thunderwizard.com. You know, I say this because it's just such a powerful tool. The truth is I really don't want to spend my whole day doing astrology readings. I enjoy doing them, but I don't, it's just, I don't want to spend my whole day just doing astrology readings. Um, but I wouldn't be doing you any service if I didn't say, go get an astrology reading from either me or one of my apprentices. Um, because it just, it solves so many problems when you can get that prescription, the right mantra to, to deal with your specific vibration, which is seen in your chart. It's just, it solves so many problems. And, um, and then the theory is what we do here. You know, reading my books, listening to, to the videos, and uh, all of that, uh, and then allowing your intellect to do its job, which is to help you get to your authentic emotional experience, authentic emotional, physical, and spiritual experience, because we are here to have an experience. All right, so I don't know if I said everything I wanted to say, but I've been babbling for almost an hour, so we'll see if there are any questions. Um, I don't see any questions here, do I? Stephen Purdy, question. Are the mantra th threads the same as the weird? So I was talking earlier about how a, gra a mantra, you know, and I'm doing my best to try and put into a visual perspective what, you know, I feel and I experience, so. Um, you know, use it for that. It's just, I'm just trying to paint a picture so that you can get an understanding. It doesn't even matter if you understand it or not. It helps. You know, we feel helped if we think we understand something. But the truth is, you know, old school, old school spirituality, you know, you go to a teacher in, in India and in uh, not so much nowadays, but in the, you know, back in the day. You go look for a teacher in India or you go look for a teacher in East Asia, even Africans. You know, you go to an African teacher and you want to learn their shamanism and their drumming. They don't explain everything to you. They say, do this. And they just give you something to do. And if you ask why, then they, then they turn away and walk away from you. They just don't have time. You know, go and do it. So mantra is that way. But sometimes it helps to understand. 
So uh, you're asking me, are the mantra threads the same as weird? Yeah, generally speaking, if that helps, weird is uh, the weird means that which has been woven. And weird uh, is still in our language because, um, you know, it, it, when people say that's weird, what they're really saying is that we don't understand how the universe works anymore. The universe is frightening to us. And when things happen from a spiritual perspective, they freak us out, so we call it weird. But originally weird meant, oh, that makes sense. That's weird. That's the weaving of the life force threads of the universe. And uh, it's woven from um, the present. In the present, every, they, there's only the present. Nothing exists outside of the present. Past and the future are illusions. But in the present moment, we make decisions. We have uh, feelings. We take actions. We, we adopt beliefs. And those create um, the past. Once you do that, you, you, once you solidify yourself into a thought, a feeling, an action, a belief, it creates a perceived past. It's a story that you tell yourself. I am this, I am that. I live this way, I do this. It creates a perceived past. This is my left hand. Perceives a past. That perceived past and that story then is going to create your future. Those are the three uh, the three threads past present and future so yeah if you want to if you want to uh, say that the mantra threads are like the web of weird yeah it, i'm okay with that what else paul kupari how do you know which mantra is good for you so you must be new to the channel if you want to ask me a question it helps if you write the word question because otherwise then i can tell that you're not just leaving an opinion because I only want to deal with questions. But um, the easy answer to that is you need to get an astrologer who knows, uh, who can look at your chart, and from that, an astrologer, a Vedic astrologer, who knows how to, uh, knows the science of mantra, can prescribe you a mantra. So for that, uh, go to astrology.thunderwizard. Dot com. The short answer to your question is you don't know. And I don't recommend people go out and try and find their own mantra. Like I said, it's like you have a disease, you go to a doctor. And the doctor will look at the x-rays and listen to your symptoms and tell you here's what you need, and he'll write a prescription for you. Don't walk into um, a, uh, a pharmacy and just start taking pills off the shelf, and you know, you're going to end up, very least, not accomplishing what you're looking for. Uh, Sethicus Boza question, do you mantra with the runes? I'm not quite sure I understand your question, but I have, if I'm following your question, what I have done is I've looked at the syllables of a mantra. You break it down into syllables. And then I put runes to that underneath it and looked at what each of those runes represent because the runes are syllables. And yeah, that'll tell me. That'll tell me a lot of what the mantra wants to do. So, for instance, the whole breath, you could call that a mantra. If you're not familiar with it, go on to my channel. By the way, you know, I, I just assume that everybody knows that I have books and videos and DVDs and all kinds of other things. To understand all that, go to courses. Dot thunderwizard.com. You can see all of my stuff. And I recommend if you want to understand what I teach, go read my books. Um, go, uh, you know, get some of the, the courses. You know, put some time and effort into learning because then lots of times, you know, what I say will, will really have a lot more impact. You'll understand on a deeper level. Uh, so, Sethicus' question. So, to, to do mantras with. So, the Hul breath. What I was saying is that the Hul breath. H-U-U-L, when you look at that, um, that tells us what the energy is doing. So, um, uh, again, if you're not familiar with it, go and look on my channel or just type in Hul Breath, and you'll see the practice I'm talking about. It's the base practice of the Thunder Wizard Path. 
And I recommend that if you want to get started in this path, go do that. If you just want to cut to the chase, you can just do that practice alone by itself. And if you did that whole breath for four hours a day for the rest of your life, you would become <laughs> an extremely powerful being. Um, so the if we put the runes to that, we got the Hagel rune, Hagalaj. Hagalaj is uh, called uh, is the Proto-Germanic word for hail, H I A L, the hailstone, which means uh, water. It's it, it can also represent snow, water, hail, and it comes in a frozen form because. What ends up happening is, is, you know, we get this, you know, snow is a really wonderful thing. Hail is a really wonderful thing. It comes uh, in this frozen form and it, it, you know, stacks up on the mountains and all that. And then when, the, when it warms up, what happens? All of that frozen water melts and goes into streams and rivers, which then nourish the plants and nourishes us. So it brings healing. You know, when you cut yourself and you scrape yourself or your hands are dirty or you're afraid, you know, you 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 got some some dirt or some garbage in you know on a cut what do you do you stick it under running water you know um you know by the way that's that's the best thing you can do to to clean something you know when you go and use a a, a porta potty they have those little squeeze bottles of the whatever that is the you know the hand sanitizer which is just basically something that will hold uh, isopropyl alcohol and people think that that cleans their hands. It doesn't. Uh, studies have been done to see um, if that stuff will cleanse you. And the end result was, yeah, if you stick your hand under flowing, you know, the flowing uh, sanitizer like water, then it'll clean off the bacteria. The water, flowing water cleans off the bacteria. Stick your hand under a faucet. You know, that's, that's a, a lot better way than just, you know, coming out of the bathroom and washing your, you know, putting, putting a handful of that isopropyl alcohol on you. It does nothing. So Hagalaj is healing. So the first, uh, the first letter of the sound of the H sound is healing. Descending, like descending water that will be released and give you nourishment and healing. And then the second two syllables are the Uruj rune. Uruj is uh, the uh, rune of pure power. And it's, uh, it represents power that is descending. So it's pure life force power descending from uh, heaven. So you've got, th you've got this, this vision of uh, you know, the ice or the water descending combined with the spiritual power. So you got two of them. You don't just have one, or it'd be hull. Hul. The two U's put together, the Uru sound, you got double the power coming in there. And then you have Laguj. Laguj is, means lake. So you can see water is really abundant here. You've got uh, the Hagalaj rune, which is frozen water, and then you've got Laguj, which is um, unfrozen water. And it represents deep, deep, deep emotional power. And when you do it with the visualization that was given to me is that you imagine the hail coming down with power through the top of your head as you're chanting it, going through your body and out through your hands and your feet into the earth. It goes down to the, um, to the center of the earth and it bubbles up and creates this steam. And the steam comes up and this is... It's incredibly powerful and cleansing. So, yeah, I mean, you can take uh, w w uh, any mantra, and if you just phonetically put out the symbols, or the, excuse me, the syllables, and then put the runes underneath it, then it will give you an energetic meaning. It might be different from what the, you know, if it's in Sanskrit and it's saying something in Sanskrit, you will get the energetic meaning that is underneath it. So the short, short answer is yes, you can do that. Um, Stephen Purdy question, what can I learn from Skuld and Urd now that I know they work with the illusion? So he's using the Old Norse words for future and past. And 
you, there's an assumption in your question. I'm not sure that I'm going to co-sign here. So you say, what can I learn from schooled and earth now that I know they work with the illusions? So I don't know what you mean by that. Um, if you were watching from the beginning, everything is an illusion, but it's not fake. It's a real thing. Just because it's, quote, an illusion, you know, reality is called maya in Sanskrit, which means illusion. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You can't just pretend it's not there. You created it. You know, I mean, I can look at people's lives and go, oh, my God, they are so wrapped up in so much nonsense. It's another way of saying it's not real. But they created it. You know, they went and did whatever they did, which created whatever patterns that they now have to live through. And, oh, my God, what a bunch of drama and nonsense. I don't want that in my life. So to answer your question, the way you learn from it is, is um, you know, stay in yourself. I, I, again, I don't know. It's like you're trying to figure something out. And, I, and, I, and I'm, the whole point of this video is not to try and figure things out. That's being stuck in your intellect. And your intellect, when you live like that, will then try and take you out of your emotions because you're trying to escape. So what you can learn from that is that you have to stay in the present. Well, you're always in the present moment whether you like it or not. But the idea is to be in the present moment and to stay aware of what you're feeling, what you're experiencing in the present moment. And then be conscious enough to take uh, 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 actions that are helpful to you. That includes beliefs. A belief is an action. Choosing to believe something is an action. To, for instance, you know, uh, deciding to say, you know, saying in the present, you know, we live in an illusion. I don't want to live in an illusion. I want to live in reality. So therefore, this illusion is nonsense. I want us to escape the matrix. So that that decision, I want to escape the matrix, boom, you've now created something, it's now your story, the past, Urd. it's now your story, your story is, I have to escape this ridiculous reality, and then your future will be that reality will continue to pelt you with, with all kinds of uh, difficulties and challenges, because the life force energy that's around you saying, hey, 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 man, you're missing the whole point, this is an experience, and so you're going to have all kinds of feelings. You're going to want to run away from your feelings, which will create another history about, and then you're going to decide that this world is hopeless. And that's just an example. I'm not saying you, Stephen Purdy, are going to do that. I'm just saying that's an example. So don't try and figure it out. Stay in the present moment. Have all of your feelings. Um, your feelings, you don't understand them or they're too much to deal with, then we've got these other four tools to deal with. We've got uh, doing energy work, which will help you to become consciously aware as well as give you physical health. We've got meditation, which will allow you to objectively look at your feelings so you can be aware. The whole point of meditation is to be aware in the moment while you're having all of your feelings to say, you know what I need to do? I need to take this action. This will be helpful to me and others. As opposed to, i got to get out of there and just reacting to them. The whole point of meditation is to be able to not escape your feelings, but to have all of them and take constructive action. And then uh, the third tool then went for really tough, really tough clogs in your sink. You need Drano. So uh, and when you've got really tough clogs in your unconscious mind, you need mantra to go in and unclog them so that once again you can become aware. You know, like the experience I told you where I was doing, I think I was doing my, no, I was doing yoga. I was doing yoga, and boom, I had this awakened vision, and I saw myself in the past, and I became aware that uh, I, I made some decisions. My soul made some decisions, and, and I held on to that, and that erupted in this lifetime as absolute fear of teaching. That if I, I thought if I taught the truth, I would be killed for it. That is an old karmic knot based on a belief that I chose to have. As I was dying, I chose to have this belief that 
I can't trust people. If I teach them the truth, they're going to kill me. When now that I've had time to meditate on it, I, and I realized I was not in my highest awareness when I was teaching. Yes, I was teaching them spiritual truths, but I wasn't having enough compassion for them to understand, hey, man, they're living in Middle Ages, and, you know, people get burned at the stake, and, you know, they can only handle so much. So teach them what they can hear that will help them. Don't shove undiluted truth down their throat. You know, they're going to barf it back up and punish you for it, which is exactly what happened. So as you can see, if you followed me, I still do that. You know, it's not that I've completely lost that tendency of mine, but that's why I'm here to have this experience, so I can continue to learn. I take responsibility, and I continue to learn. All right, I hope that answered your question. Um, all right, so that's it for me. I don't see any more questions. Uh, so I'm going to call it an evening. So again, go to thunderwizard.com YouTube channel and subscribe. Go to, uh, you can go directly to the thunderwizard.com channel and subscribe there as well. If you want to support this channel and support this work, especially these Q&As, then please go there and subscribe at whatever level you want. You can get access to all of the shamanism. I don't know how many hours of shamanism where I teach you about energy work, runes, mantra, theory. I mean, there's just so much stuff. Uh, ritual, the nine worlds, magic, shamanism, all that. And um, there's a new tier that is for the Manifestation Mastery course, which we're getting into. And um, you can learn how to uh, get all three of your minds working together so that you can manifest your reality, to sync your reality into being. And um, continue to look. There's more stuff coming. Go to courses.thunderwizard.com to see everything that there is and uh, take advantage of whatever will be helpful for you. Uh, let's see, anything else? Two more comments it says here. No, that's it. Okay, so that's all. Um, stay tuned. There's a lot more coming. I'm going to be uh, releasing a lot of new information and teachings. And what I'm doing is I'm getting myself prepared uh, because in a few months I'm going to pack up uh, and just live out of my suitcase and travel around Australia and New Zealand for I don't even know how long and surf and I'll be still doing the same thing I'm doing now. I'll still be teaching, but I'll be doing it from my laptop down there. And So I'm trying to get as much teachings out there and there's going to be some packages coming up. Once I get all of these things out, then I'm going to create some packages where we put things together and you can just get these huge concentrated chunks of different teachings and practices. And I'm doing that so that uh, while I'm down there, I don't have to spend a lot of time continuing to try and come up with new uh, practices. We, we can just get to the, to the videos and just do these kinds of things. All right, so um, that's it for me, my friends. I shall see you next time. So you are a spiritual seeker, a spiritual practitioner, and you want to work from home. You want to work for yourself. And like me, you want to make money doing something that you would do anyway. I have two avenues for you to make money doing what you would do anyway. The first is astrologycertification.thunderwizard.com. You can learn my specific, very unique niche of Vedic astrology. And then if you become certified, I will put you on the astrology.thunderwizard.com page and people will see your beautiful face. They'll click on you and they can get a reading from you. Like I said, this is easily the most uh, profitable service that I have in my arsenal for myself. Then you'll get your own webpage, joshmo.thunderwizard.com, and people can go there when you want to give out readings. Now, if you have other things that you want to list on there too, you uh, dog sit, you are a masseuse, you do tarot readings, I don't care what it is. As long as you put, give me the information, I'll put it on your page. People go to joshmo.thunderwizard.com, they can see everything that you do. There's another uh, way that you can make money as a thunderwizard.com student, and that is runereadings.thunderwizard.com. 
Same thing applies there. If you become certified, there's over 36 hours of Rune videos that I have on there. All of my Rune videos, both public and private, that you can learn from. If you become certified, then I will put you on the runereadings.thunderwizard.com page. And once again, you will get your own page, joeschmo.thunderwizard.com. If you're already uh, an astrologer, you'll have your astrology information, your rune reading information, whatever other things that you want to promote for yourself. Listen, I am not here just to sit here and teach. I'm here to create teachers. And I'm here to teach people who are called to do so to make a good living sharing the information that they would study on their own anyway. That's how I make my living. I can teach you how to do that. These are two ways to do it. So if you want to get started with that, go to astrology.thunder, excuse me, go to astrologycertification.thunderwizard.com if you want to become an astrologer. If you want to become a rune reader, go to runecertification.thunderwizard.com. Okay, enjoy the video.